thank uh, the um, Institute Ming Telecom for inviting me here. I'm really pleased to be here, very privileged and honored to be here as well. Um, I, I, was, I did live in France before I, I went to Japan just under three years ago. Um, and I taught here and did various things, but I never actually gave a conference. So maybe you have to leave before you can come back and do different things. Anyway, let me start with uh, a couple of, uh, to some extent, like Helen was saying about the French, I'm not going to speak in French, so I apologize as well for that. But let me offer some other sort of um, uh, caveats, if, if I can. Um, because I'm going to try and speak about uh, conceptions of the subject uh, in Japan as a way of trying to understand um, the subject who is um, implicit and explicit in the, the, the Western argument and debate about um, privacy. Um, so we're trying to speak about some Japanese alternative, perhaps, or some Japanese conception um, I'm limited by several things, one of which obviously is the language. I don't as yet come anywhere near to mastering the Japanese language. I wouldn't even say I speak the Japanese language. Um, so, to the extent, so to what extent I can actually speak with any coherence or authority on that is, is questionable. And indeed many people in the world of Japanese studies, which is a big field, suggest if you can't speak the language you shouldn't have or you shouldn't say too much about it. So that's the first problem. The, the second is, um, if you like, being limited a little, little bit by difference. Um, it's taken me a long time to land on my feet, as it were, in, in uh, Japan. Uh, only within the last six months have I actually been able to get into something like Japanese philosophy. And that obviously is an area which is trying to develop itself in, um, in a way to distinguish itself from Confucian philosophy. So the actual word Japanese philosophy is quite new and um, it's very often subsumed into some sort of Confucian Chinese thought. So that's quite new and I'm very new to it as well. Um, thirdly, I'm also limited to some extent by interdisciplinarity. I'm not here, I don't think, as an expert and I certainly wouldn't even try to pass myself off as one on privacy. Um, uh, but I think I would like, as I said earlier, just to try and offer some reflections on what uh, the subject might be in Japan, um, and in, in, as a way to sort of problematize the Western conception, which I think Helen is implicitly doing, um, I'm possibly misreading her, but I, I take what she's doing to be some sort of lack of confidence um, in the capacities of the Western subject to defend him or herself um, when they face as an individual the many organizational, institutional, governmental um, others. Uh, and when we have to exchange that information, do, does the individual on their own, can they stand up to that challenge? Um, especially when it's virtual online and, and the information we have to hand over in this pairwise contract um, is handed over and we're often not aware or, or too bothered at the time of clicking, yes, I agree, um, what will happen to it? So uh, in that sense, I think there's a sort of an implicit sense within Helen's um, approach that doesn't see the subject, or the conception of the subject as sufficient. Um, and that also might be linked to the fact that essentially here in, in, in privacy and certainly in this notion of contracting, we are very much talking about a, a homo economicus, that, that sense of the, of the subject who um, is seen to make a choice, and that choice is seen to justify the outcome, when very often the outcome um, or, or the choice is circumscribed to begin with. You know, in the world of economics, there's limited access to the perfect information we're still all supposed to possess. Um, we're very often subject to bigger forces, corporations in shaping our decisions, yet nonetheless, the responsibility of the onus is put on the subject and his or her choices. As I say, it's not actually because that choice is made as an independent autonomous choice, but simply to justify the outcome. So those are some of the limitations. But um, on the more positive side and in the broader issue, uh, I also have a kind of a bee in my bonnet about the Western subject. And I kind of have to have that bee in my bonnet, that problem, because um, again, like Helen, I'm also from South Africa. And a lot of people who leave South Africa 
like people from many former colonies, I'm sure that's not exceptional to France, they kind of have a love-hate relationship with the former colonizer. Um, and the former colonizer in South Africa uh, is the UK. And um, the UK, you know, even if it may not say so, is part of Europe. And Europe for me is where the, the, the Eurocentric subject comes from. And I just have this pathological dislike of it. Um, also, philosophically speaking, um, I find that neoliberal globalization is driven by um, uh, a liberal autonomous subject, the one I see at the heart of privacy. And um, I think it's not only the justification, but will be the eventual outcome um, if neoliberal globalization is not resisted in some ways. So again, that brings me back to the, the issue of the subject. So those are just some preliminary remarks. Um, let me then start by trying to um, give an entry into this, this problem of thinking outside of a European context and from a point of view of, of, of Japan. Um, in the preface to the, the Order of Things, uh, Michel Foucault um, spoke in his rather melodramatic fashion about this laughter that he had when he came across um, this ch the Chinese encyclopedia that he'd found in Bourges. Um, Bourges' the Analytic of Language of John Wilkins. And what made him laugh was the fact, was the way in which animals had been classified um, by the Chinese. Just to cite a few of the examples, animals were um, divided either belonging to the emperor, um, embalmed, or they were tame, or some animals were suckling pigs, others were yet sirens, others simply fabulous, um, others stray dogs, some frenzied. So these are all classifications of animals, and as Foucault said, when he came across this classification, it just made no sense. Um, and his question that he asked was, how can we start to think um, uh, differently? Uh, well, perhaps we can't think like a Chinese encyclopedist thought, um, but I think what Foucault was also was saying was, when we confront it with this different way of thinking, how does it reflect back on what we do? So that's how, how I see what I'm trying to do to today. Um, so let me say a few words, preliminary remarks as well about what I understand privacy to be, the subject of it, and then go into why it might not pan out and work in a place like Japan. So for privacy, I take it to be something fairly um, simple and liberal, a little bit like Helen was um, sketching earlier. There's a, a well-known definition by Adam Weston in a classic, The Privacy and Freedom text written in 1967, where he says, privacy is a claim by an individual to determine what information about himself or herself should be known. And I suppose when it's about what information should be known, it's also about when that information should be obtained and what uses it should be put. Now, this claim becomes a right when it is recognized, obviously, by law um, or indeed by social convention, which I think, again, is something Helen was implying earlier. Um, so in their famous phrase, uh, on the famous article, sorry, the, the right to privacy by uh, Louis Brandeis and Samuel Warren, they simply defined the legal right to privacy as the right to be let alone. Um, Brandeis was eventually to become a, a Supreme Court judge um, and also the person who gave his name to Brandeis University. But in their nice uh, formulation, privacy is the right to be let alone, a very simple definition um, that they gave. So the right to be let alone um, is, um, what does that imply? Well, it implies that that right is what mediates the relationship between the individual and typically the state, um, or a third party that is subject to some sort of regulation put in place by the state. Um, and the reason that that right needs to mediate that relationship between the individual and the other, um, as I say, whether it's a, an online um, in relationship or the state or a, a group of people, um, is because I think there's the notion that that individual needs corporeal sovereignty in the early days of the modern uh, adventure, certainly to protect individuals in their bodily integrity from arbitrary violence. Eventually that sort of um, developed into notions of protecting some sort of mental aspect of the human being precisely because as an individual they should or, or needed 
uh, that private realm in which to decide what was best for them. Um, in the famous phrase of John Stuart Mill, they need to be concerned and left alone uh, in all those um, self-regarding actions, even though obviously that's problematic. But everything that concerned oneself, the idea was we should be left alone and no one else should tell us what to do. Um, so privacy can come down to uh, being linked to a subject. And um, we can then also get, get to the idea of various invasions of privacy. Um, these invasions of privacy, which obviously stoke our concern, um, could be you know, a, a variety of things, something like personal information being released into the public realm. And recently there's been se several debates. I mean, the, the internet is a, a weird place and uh, maybe it's indicative of what I read and I shouldn't actually divulge this information to you. But the idea of revenge porn has been on the agenda recently in, in the things I read anyway. Um, uh, and that's really interesting from the privacy point of view because uh, the idea of revenge porn, and typically there's a gender hierarchy there, this in some way in, in a relationship, cameras come out and people film each other. The, 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 obviously there is consent, uh, but there's also an element of trust that, that's just between those two people. Yet revenge porn is when the couple breaks up and one of the parties, as I say, nine times out of ten it's the man, releases the porn, or the, the pictures, I don't suppose it would be porn, it would be very intimate pictures, releases them on the internet as a revenge against the former partner. Um, so that's obviously a clear invasion of privacy which we would need to do something about. Um, there's also decisions sometimes made on our behalf without, made on our behalf without consent. And there's also data, um, I guess, one of the key concerns, which is provided in con confidence to one institution but is then shared or sold to, to other institutions. So by privacy, we can mean something uh, related to personal autonomy, the right to decide for ourselves about everything that concerns us only. We can mean something like uh, self-determination, the right to control the flow of information about ourselves, even when others demand access to it. We can also mean something like consummatory claims. Um, here, this is something like a right to, to dignity. In other words, we are often put in situations um, uh, in unforeseen circumstances. Uh, for example, I was just watching this morning the uh, issue about uh, migrants in Italy. And the film is obviously TV cameras at the port side filming the migrants who have been fished out of the sea. And there was one woman who was unconscious, but the camera was in her face as she came off the boat and was put into the ambulance and taken away. Consummatory claims is about the right to dignity, privacy as an end, and not to be uh, put in the public sphere uh, uh, um, uh, for, the, for the means of consumption by the, the viewer on the TV. And also, uh, privacy can mean something about strategic intent, the right to stay silent in a negotiation, um, uh, to keep your intentions unclear, just deliberately to, to further your own interests, as I say, in some sort of negotiation. But whether we define privacy then as something like personal autonomy, self-determination, something about consuming, um, not to be a, a consumable item, or whether we use it in terms of, of the strategic intent of the actor, um, the common denominator, I think, is this Western subject. That is the subject who authors everything he or she has ever produced, who obviously knows as an autonomous uh, entity, who, who decides, who creates, so you have all these um, rights in the US Constitution, for example, protecting almost a right to creativity, the intellectual property. We need to have a private realm. We need to be, have tenure in universities precisely so that you can create in, in safety and security without interference. And then obviously go on to capitalize when you um, sell that knowledge. This subject is also the one who envisions, who chooses, who imagines. Um, uh, always within a realm of private, uh, private action. So, let me then try and um, sketch out a Japanese approach to the subject, which isn't one that decides, knows all the time, who is independent, who is a, a little world of creation and imagination, who has the right to, um, to have a sphere of privacy cut off from everyone else. 
let me try and imagine what that might look like. And, and to do so, I need to get involved in um, a theory of Japanese-ness, for lack of a better, uh, a better way to translate it. The theory of Japanese-ness um, is a very controversial cultural discourse in Japan that talks about certain unique features um, that the Japanese have in terms of political dispensation, culture, most obviously in terms of their language, uh, a hugely complicated language. Um, uh, it also talks about something unique in terms of social arrangements and what we would, I'd like to look at today, uh, the actual Japanese person, him or herself. Um, this, this, in fact, is also the perception that many people outside Japan have as well. Um, if I take a famous example here of Emil Durkheim, um, writing at the end of the 19th century, uh, he said, Japan may in the future borrow our arts, our industry, even our political organization. It will not cease, however, to belong to a different species from France and Germany. Um, in the same way, uh, Alexander Koyev, the great um, Hegelian interpreter in, in post-war France, after a, a trip to, to Japan in 1959, said, there I was able to observe a society that is one of a kind. Um, there's also a famous text by um, uh, uh, Ruth uh, uh, Benedict, um, where she talks about the, the Japanese in the, in the text, the chrysanthemum and the sword. She says, and I quote, the Japanese are to the highest degree both aggressive and, and aggressive, both militaristic and aesthetic, both insolent and polite, rigid and adaptable. Um, uh, and also there is the text of Foucault I spoke about earlier in terms of the other as the Orient, um, or Asia perhaps better. Uh, but also Foucault himself went to, to Japan. There's even a picture of him in his kimono. He spent some time in the Zen temple thinking he was really getting involved with the other. Um, but Foucault also expressed a lot of perplexed uh, perceptions about Japan. He wasn't quite sure how to deal with it. So from the outside, from our perspective here, if you like, looking at Japan, we buy into the argument about something unique. From the inside of Japan, that uniqueness is also developed very, very um, strongly. And I want to say, as I said, some, say something about that uh, today. Um, so, Nihon Jin Rin, uh, which is this theory of Japaneseness. Um, there's a there's a, 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 um, a little saying: Japanese spirit, Western technology, which characterizes the approach of Japan with the Meiji Restoration in 1868 when it opened up. Um, and the idea there is Japanese spirit, so the soul, the subject, is unique. Keep that but introduce and bring in Western technology. Um, and that's very much how, the, 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 um, how it's gone. There's been this attempt to, um, uh, you know, in all these writers I've cited earlier, and certainly within Japan, there's this perception that it's an anachronism, it's unique. It's got everything we have, at the same time as keeping its own uh, culture. That's what I'm trying to unpack here today, but at the level of the subject. Um, so where does this theory of Japanese-ness of the unique subject come from? Well, there are antecedents in uh, Confucianism. Um, in Confucianism, the self, the subject, emerges to what we would call self-consciousness, always through fulfilling social roles, never on his or her own. Um, so personhood is not about autonomy, um, but it's something that is with others, if I can say that. Indeed, any attempt to demarcate yourself off from others to establish something like what we would understand to be autonomy is seen as, as in, in fact, a lack of full personhood. It's folly. It's, it's a misguided attempt. You, you, you cannot be someone on your own. It's always relational. So there's that Confucian antecedent. There's also a Buddhist antecedent, and I know, you know, I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to go off and tell you I've reconverted into some sort of Zen monk. It might still happen, but I have to just touch on these big concepts, um, sketching them, um, as Helen said earlier, just to give you the sense of, of, of where this Japanese sense of uniqueness is coming from. In Buddhism, um, there's also this notion of an extracorporeal self, 
so interrelational. However, in, in, um, in contradistinction to Confucianism, that notion of the self obviously continues after the body um, dies, or, or ceases to, to live, rather. And um, that, that uh, extracorporeal self is obviously going to come back through some form of reincarnation. Um, so any attempt to introduce autonomy into that conception of the self, again, is delusional because it intervenes with a much greater transcendental project that is operating on our behalf. Um, so again, an attempt to carve yourself off is, is an attempt to step outside a process that is much larger than ourselves and takes part in a, a place in a cyclical fashion. So in both Confucianism and in Buddhism, the notion of the self is really not only not there, but attempts to um, uh, introduce it, to become it, are actually seen as upsetting a larger system and hubris in many ways. There's also in the samurai ethic um, of the uh, Tokugawa period, which precedes the Meiji Restoration and Japan's entry into modernity, um, and you've no doubt seen the films with Tom Cruise and people, uh, trying to get at this, this, this amazing samurai ethic. Well, you know, there is something in that. There's loyalty, discipline, sincerity are the, are the core aspects of selfhood. The ideal person, in fact, is this very strong self, a very virile self, um, who through very severe physical and mental training uh, produces a capacity both for loyalty and self-sacrifice. Um, in, in other words, the proper samurai self is bifurcated. On the one hand, um, there is a self-discipline which transcends the individual samurai. And that self-discipline has to be so strong that at the moment of showing your loyalty, you should be able to commit, as we know, harikiri. So that's really about that self-discipline subject in a sort of Nietzschean fashion, a self-overcoming, but a self-overcoming not to, to move towards some sort of autonomy, um, uh, or rather not some sort of um, uh, aristocratic form of self-governing in the sort of Greek tradition that Foucault picked up on, but rather the self-overcoming in terms of suicide, negating the self entirely. So in those three traditions, um, just very loosely sketched, you can see there is no notion whatsoever of an autonomous subject. Um, and we can start imagining that also questions of privacy won't be too uh, paramount there either. Um, and also, let me just say that at this stage on Thursday, when we um, also have a chance uh, uh, to speak, um, I'd like to speak a bit more about the context of privacy in the public space and civil society, but I won't go into that here. Um, so that's just a little sketch of this Japanese uniqueness. Let me, before I develop a little bit more, just say something about how legitimate it is to speak about that. Because like all claims about uniqueness, um, they very much are an essentialist narrative. Um, they're a construct in many ways of an imaginary community, an imaginary self. And uh, a writer, Yoshio Sugimoto, who is Japanese, but has spent all his life at La Trobe University in, in um, Australia, uh, is one of the, the strongest critics of this Japanese-ness, this, this theory. I mean, this theory is quite strange. It goes so far as to suggest that the Japanese intestine is much shorter in length than our intestine, and therefore the Japanese diet not only is, but must be different um, to ours. Uh, so you can see why there's probably a lot of room to want to criticize that. And, and in fact, I did some research to see to what extent that might be true. And you can find some fairly eminent scholars who will make the claim that intestines do differ across cultures. But I think you can see where that's heading to, this uniqueness idea. Um, but nonetheless, Sugimoto says that this is no longer valid. He says it's no longer valid because there are a whole lot of methodological problems with this theory of uniqueness. It assumes all Japanese across the archipelago are the same. Whereas we know, obviously, from the north in Hokkaido, right down to the south in Okinawa, there are very distinct ethnic groups. So to talk about one Japanese culture is rather problematic. Also, he suggests that there's been a lot of immigration into Japan recently. So even if that may have been true in the past, it can't be today. Well, again, all this is relative. 
um, the foreign population in Japan today is still very low, still very controlled. Um, the largest immigrant communities are Koreans and Chinese and Brazilian and Japanese who make up no more than 1% of the population. The irony is I'm in Japan in a, uh, as part of a process of internationalization in the universities. And as part of that process, they're offering um, degree programs in English. However, the largest amount of foreign people in Japan, as I've just mentioned, are Koreans and Japanese. So if it was really serious, they would be offering degree programs in Chinese, not in English. Anyway, um, the point is simply, is this discourse coherent? Is it tenable? Well, I'm not trying to support it, uh, but I think it's very powerful in the Japanese imaginary. And indeed, in various um, uh, opinion polls, invasions to privacy, if you will, people still identify very strongly with it. So uh, I'm simply saying that there are a lot of reasons to doubt this discourse about Japanese uniqueness. However, I think it's still at the stage where it's a very powerful imaginary, um, uh, the, the, it defines the imaginary in, in Japan, and people identify and self-constitute themselves through it today nonetheless. Um, so that's my justification for looking at it, even though there are good reasons to, and to doubt it, and philosophically, I think, we can critique it. Um, so, Japanese uniqueness. Let me just look at it, look, look at it in three levels. The, the subject, the interpersonal, and the intergroup. At the level of the subject, as I mentioned earlier in touching on the Confucian and um, Buddhist and samurai ethic, uh, personality really takes place without any independent self. The personhood does not include what we understand by uh, a self, a subject, um, in days gone by, a soul. Um, there's a famous text by Takeo Doi, who talks about a concept of amai. Um, what this suggests is that the Japanese, he, he argues, have an inc inclination to seek emotional satisfaction by prevailing upon and depending on their superiors. Um, it's almost an infantile relationship. It can characterize the relationship of child to parent, but it also can characterize the relationship of uh, PhD student to um, their supervisor or a company employee to their um, superior. So it's, an, it's a, an inbuilt, an inner sense, a desire to prevail, to draw, to, to rely on your superior, um, and to flourish through that. Um, there's no attempt to flourish, to become a person individually. It's always through that relationship to, to the other, to the superior. Also, when this, this um, notion of amai, this dependence, this willingness, this willing subservience from our point of view, when that's combined with a very, very Japanese characteristic of gambaru, it's uh, a notion that you hear every day, all day, um, which means something like good luck, work hard, you have to stay late at the office, gambaru, do your best. Um, you, you're, you're playing a, a tennis match tomorrow against a champion, gambaru, good luck. It's a very um, powerful notion. And um, if I haven't lost all my notes, this notion of gambaru is very, very Japanese. Um, just one second. This is also Japanese. It may look like it's organized from the outside, but it's complete chaos in Japan. Um, so this is, so I'm actually becoming Japanese slowly but surely. Um, so gambaru is, uh, as I said, this concept. Um, it means not giving up, it means hanging in. And when it's introduced into this context where we are willingly dependent and subservient upon others, um, it, it creates a very interesting conception of the self. What's also interesting here is that gambaru has no opposite in Japanese. There's no alternative. Work hard, keep going, good luck. I wouldn't like to be in your situation, but you know, nonetheless, I empathize. There's no opposite. There's no alternative. In fact, Japanese had to import um, words like relaxu, relax. It had to import words like reja, leisure, time. And because those words are imported, they 
have a slightly pejorative impression. To the extent that Gambaru characterizes both your attitude when you face uphill, difficult tasks, when you're confronted with a real challenge, and that, that attitude also then characterizes your leisure, which explains partly why Japanese people never take holidays, and if they do, it's four or five days at a time. Because in fact, taking time off requires good luck. You're taking time off, well, good luck, I hope you get through it. Um, but of course, also taking time off is taking time off from the group. So negating who you really are as a member of that group. So that's the first aspect at the sort of level of the subject. There is a, a sense of selfhood, which is in relation and dependence. Um, and even when that relationship is not going well, you're still in, incited and encouraged by the culture to keep working at it. It will get right. Secondly, the interpersonal level um, w within the group, as it were. Uh, here, interaction is always aligned with one's group orientation. And the key orientation of any group must be harmony. So for Chie Nakani, um, harmony requires a cultivation and a maintenance of relations between superiors and inferiors. And one's status within the group is a function of how long one has been in it. So it's a bit like French universities in that you need to do, do your time before you can get a look in. Um, but uh, within the group, then, what is key is the hierarchical chain that you're involved in. So to, to stick to a context in which perhaps many of you are familiar, or I suppose in a corporate context, what's important is not your direct colleague, but the person who is your superior and their superior. So again, to give some anecdotal evidence, I know this is far from social, socially, scientifically uh, useful, but um, I've had relative difficulty integrating into the university I'm in, because until I was doing research for this paper, I realized I was trying to work across horizontally and in some sort of collegial fashion. But in fact, that's the whole problem. It's not across that you work, it's up the ladder. Um, so within the group, the interpersonal relationship is, as I say, it's about producing harmony, but harmony up the chain, not across the chain. Um, so one, one sort of consequence of this is that the study of the individual is, is a bit superfluous. It, it, it has no point. Um, the interpersonal relationship itself, not the individuals that constitute it, is what selfhood is all about. And again, in that sense, it's almost extracorporeal. It's outside. Um, but that sense of selfhood is also outside the subject because of the language. So again, just to give some examples here, most Japanese students um, who enter university will be expected to know about 3,000 um, characters, Jap uh, uh, Japanese, Chinese origin characters. Um, and 3,000 would allow you to read a newspaper and a university textbook. However, there's no way that you can remember those all. So very often, um, and this is what I'm getting at in terms of selfhood being outside within the language, when you ask a question, um, there's never a straight answer, not because the student doesn't know it, but because the picture character they need to refer to has been slightly forgotten, and there needs to be a consultation about not only what the right picture character might be, but then also the correct interpretation to give to it, because each character's interpretation is a function of what other characters it's linked to, and also the context in which it's being discussed. So, so much of discussion and conversation takes place in this sort of ethereal realm between people, not within them. And I think you can start to understand why notions of self will then won't, won't be anchored within the famous ghost in the machine that the, the West is preoccupied with. Um, so we can perhaps call that, that subject some sort of virtual self in a, a reality, in a, in a context, as um, Helen was saying earlier. Um, and given that situation, you would want to ask the question, well, why would that type of subjectivity want to lay claim to being the owner and therefore make a demand for privacy of ideas, feelings, emotions, thoughts, preferences, or personal forms of information 
when they are only ever intersubjectively constituted. Um, finally, then, uh, the third aspect I'd like to look at, the first was the subject, the second was um, uh, intra-group, and now what about between groups? Well, um, integration and harmony, again, is to be achieved between groups, like-minded groups, and therefore necessarily Japanese. Um, and in fact, there's even an argument to be made that in trying to get groups to at, uh, pursue the same goal, you can have some sort of rivalry between them. And the rivalry is such that they're all pursuing the same goal, but in different ways, that the actual final outcome is uh, much more productive. Uh, but that also means that for privacy, um, it can never be legislated or, or um, thought about um, until it's too late in some senses. By which I mean problems for that, that type of group with subjects who are bound by loyalty and the group harmony, um, problems will always be resolved perhaps post hoc, if I can say that, um, because you simply cannot step out of line. You have to toe the line. Uh, so there's a famous case of uh, Mike Woodward, who was appointed chief exec uh, operating officer, executive officer of Olympus Cameras, and came across the fact that are we, you know, five years before he was appointed and finally fired in 2011, there was a huge amount of uh, fraudulent accounting going on at Olympus because they had been making a, a huge financial losses over the previous five years. Everyone knew about it, but no one said anything about it. And that's obviously the, the downside for us. You, you cannot be a whistleblower. You cannot step outside the context. And, and it almost needed that foreign British um, CEO to come in and say, well, what's happening here? He was fired as a result, but you know, the, the, the lesson had been learned. So if I can characterize and finally caricature rather um, to finish what this other subject might be, um, I would do it as follows, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here uh, a professor at the University of Togo, uh, Tokyo, Takada, um, and I still haven't worked out whether he himself is caricatur caricaturing Japanese-ness or actually advocating it. Um, but anyway, the way he set, puts it, and um, he uses a lot of Western language, so it makes it quite accessible. Firstly, to be a good Japanese, um, in other words, to deny yourself the self we understand. Try to find out the forces and the workings of the superego, Freudian language. Um, the superego, the I, is often related to big things like truth, justice, rights, and conscious. Um, find them and then weaken them as much as possible. Um, nothing is more important than personal relations in which other persons come first in everything. Since you owe them everything, it's impertinent, it's a folly, to express your own opinion, be conformist. But do not forget to demarcate from strangers those intimate fellows who form your inner circle. So there's always an inner circle to which we belong, um, but not as a, an individual, only as part of that circle. Always relate your obligations and sense of who you are to that inner circle. Um, uh, also, abandon any notions of an independent subject. Consider everything else as natural including all those man-made things from the West, such as history, nation states, politics, and I might add things like earthquakes and disasters, which gives that impression of a very stoical acceptance of these events. Um, they're all natural, there's nothing we can do about them, and it's a bit crazy to think we can. Don't be well planned, you have nothing to worry about uh, in terms of the consequences of your action. And he finishes off by saying, carpe diem hike nunc, seize the day here and now as a part of that group. Um, but never as an individual. So I'll terminate there. Um, I'm simply, as I said at the beginning, trying to sketch out alternative accounts of subjectivity as um, a way to think privacy in the long term, I suppose, in a, in a different way. Um, and uh, obviously I haven't got as far as thinking of, about what privacy might need to look at, look like, with a different type of subjectivity, like, like the one I've sketched today. But I would sort of just suggest that maybe privacy wouldn't be the issue for that type of subject, given that everything is intersubjectively and publicly um, mediated to begin with. 
So those are very general ideas and um, very much work in progress, but it's just a, a little view from the outside about what it might look like on the inside. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brigham. We have still 10 minutes for any questions. Karine? Yes. Uh, well, I'm not sure I got everything. Thank you for this uh, very challenging, I mean, philosophically speaking, uh, you know, discussion. Uh, me, I have, uh, I have two, two questions and comments. Uh, the first one relates to uh, the first part of your talk. And I, I do understand why uh, you bring the, this, uh, your work into the debate of liberal globalization as an alternative to, you know, liberal globalization. Uh, but for me, you know, uh, part of this alternative of, a global, um, of liberal globalization is really the, the world of interdependence. And I am conducting uh, this work more as a political scientist, but for me, interdependence, you need to be independent to behave in interdependence. So the first set of questions is really, uh, you know, I, I'm just wondering, you very much focus on the autonomy, but I'm just wondering whether you should not make a kind of comparative analysis between autonomy and independence. And my second set of questions refers to transcendence and to spiritual aspect which is not very obvious of what you say, but we can guess when you relate to Buddhism or, Con or Confucianism, etc. And again here, I'm just wondering whether we are not, you are not talking and we are not talking about oneness as a person being part of, of, of a wall, as a person being part of a wall, with relation to nature, cosmos, etc., as it is in Confucianism and Buddhism. Uh, and uh, maybe, again, there could be a discussion about autonomy. Because it is not so much autonomy in that circumstance, it is more to do about being part of a whole, being part living in an interdependent world, and being is, is much more the concept of oneness, I think. Voilà. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so well, if, if an alternative to globalization could be some notion of interdependence, and if that's the case, don't the actors have to be independent to begin with? Um, and how does that contrast with autonomy? Uh, well, just on the, on the autonomy front, I'm using it very much in a, a Kantian sense of maturity um, and the sort of virtue supposedly of that is that we're independent in our thought and action. Um, so that, that's very much, uh, you know, autos nomos, the self-producer of norms and values. Uh, very much linked to a, a Western philosophical conception of the subject. Independence, um, is it the condition of possibility for interdependence? Um, yeah, I still think that's kind of a methodological individualist approach uh, in the sense that, um, you know, uh, I would follow Zygmunt Bauman here who says, um, you know, we're drawn into globalization whether we like it or not. It's not a question of stepping outside of it. And it therefore throws us into an ethical challenge of real otherness. Um, so to think that we've all been drawn into it and then we can step back and, cr you know, re-articulate our independence and then interact as an in interdependent world as equals, I think is a little ruse of neoliberal ideology. Um, or, or thought. In terms of the transcendence aspect, again, I'm not trying to uh, come across as any near expert or knowledgeable about the religious side of Confucianism. I just use that to show how the subject is um, 
not located within a body, to, so to speak, which doesn't mean I was getting at some sort of transcendent notion, I just meant it's very intersubjectively fashioned. Um, uh, and so in terms of oneness and wholeness, uh, perhaps you're getting at something like, can the part be independent within the whole? Uh, I would sort of flip that around as people usually do and say, as, you, as people usually do and say that, um, it's not so much the whole is bigger than the parts, but the parts constitute the whole and can't step out of it, otherwise it would collapse. So it's, um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's answering the question, but. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, my question is actually, well, my way of uh, um, bullying you into answering uh, the, the question about privacy, because uh, of course you've been discussing and problematizing subjectivity and I would want to know uh, what could be a possible, a possible uh, application or, or, or conjunction between uh, this uh, problematization of, of subjectivity and uh, your notion of privacy. I would like to, to invite you to, to, to discuss this, if you have uh, one minute, by uh, taking into account uh, one example that comes from the social media environment in Japan. Uh, a few years ago, the uh, up-and-coming uh, social networking service was Mixi. Mixi was, yeah, you, you probably have some familiarity with that, uh, and it has a very uh, a peculiar uh, way of uh, allowing privacy uh, by, uh, you know, allowing silence. You can visit the page of, or the profile of another user and do not say anything. You are not invited to poke or to like or to discuss or to comment or to post anything, but you leave traces. And this is a way of, you know, uh, making presence and, of course, defining the limit of privacy in this, in such an environment. Uh, so, do you have any uh, any thought on that? Or? Yeah, um, not a very good bully, are you? Uh, so, um, yeah, no, you, you're entirely right to want to um, have some sort of practical application. Uh, in terms of privacy. Well, uh, I, as I said, I would like to develop that a bit more on Thursday and maybe talk about Japan in, ter in terms of a supervised rather than a surveyed society. Um, and to suggest that the question of privacy, it, it's there, but it's, it can't, well, we, we're forced to use the word privacy, but it, it can't be thought of in the same ways um, so again, just to give very anecdotal evidence, there is clear privacy going on in, in, in interaction with, with and between Japanese people in terms of one never steps inside their house. Um, that just doesn't happen. So that's clearly a private, you know, a classic private realm. Um, also, one never addresses or, or, or talks about so-called private personal issues in, in the workplace ever. Um, it just doesn't happen. So there's obviously norms that are operating, uh, which one needs to learn. And whether we can call them privacy, I, I, I don't know. There's also various notions of inner and outer. So depending on context, um, you will reveal or you won't reveal certain things. So just an example again, the word for house, the, the character for house obviously stands for house as a private realm, but it also stands for your membership of your inner, most inner circle. So it's the, 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 the character translates more as inner, so house in something. Um, so again, there's, there's one character that signifies different places um, and carries with it notions of privacy. So within the house, no one else steps in within your close inner circle of friends or colleagues, you reveal some things, but not to the next level outside. Um, so I, I think, again, as I say, you're right, there's issues of privacy, and certainly when it comes to uh, more recent technologies, um, then this whole notion of Japanese-ness will be transformed, because I think surveillance technologies are radically transforming of the Western and any subject. Um, but I still just have a problem of using the language we have, but I guess we have no alternative um, uh, to describe those spaces of privacy there. So thank you very much to Ellen Zambom and Bregan Lagesh. And uh, thank you to all.